us as a contributor of many beautiful theorems in complex analysis and real analysis. And he will speak today a new look at some old part, a theorem. When Professor Martin asked me to give one of the lectures of the symposium, he said something to the effect that the intention was that the speaker should tell where the subject came from and where it's going. Well, I know nothing about where it's going, I've read a little about where it's been. And so what I will talk about today will be completely non-technical. I will give you a highly opinionated look at uh, some of the history of temperature. The, uh, <coughs> both the theorems that I'll talk about will be old. And uh, let's begin with the oldest of all, namely the Cauchy theorem. Now, <coughs> the Cauchy theorem which says that if you take a homomorphic function, you integrate it around a suitable path, you get zero. Or if you like the Cauchy formula, f of z equals 1 over 2 to my i, n to some curve, f of w over w minus z dz. <laughs> forms, like in our first book, or the, uh, <coughs> another piece of machinery that we can use is uh, Runge's theorem. This was originated by Sachs and Zygmunt, I think, this way of getting at the Cauchy theorem. They simply prove the theorem first for rational functions and approximate uh, and get it for all the functions in general. Now the, uh, <coughs> the paper, very recently, by uh, John D. Dixon in the 
building in August 1971. This symposium is about analysis in the 70s. And he uh, gives a very brief and I think very elegant proof of the general uh, formulation of Cauchy theorem, assuming the uh, local structure, assuming the, the Cauchy theorem in the disk, say, and assuming the uh, local information of all local functions that we get from that. Now, what he does is the following. He writes down the following function. He finds the two pieces. One is the integral over gamma of uh, the f of w minus uh, f of z divided by w minus z dw. This is for z in the region omega. Maybe it's this one here. And he defines it to be the integral of the term onto a gamma of just f of w over w minus z dw. This for all points z whose index with respect to gamma is zero. And if you look at this function h, you find the general version of the Cauchy theorem. The point is this. We're assuming that the, uh, every point in the complement of omega has index zero. Now, the set of points where the index is zero is an open set. But the two open sets which uh, occur here overlap, of course. But in the overlap, the uh, index is zero, which means that the integral of f of z over w minus z is zero. So the two things agree. Furthermore, what about the definition in here? Well, <clears throat> when z is off the curve gamma, everything is fine. When z is on the curve gamma, of course, this is interpreted as a derivative of f. And the local information one needs is uh, that this is a homomorphic function uh, of w for any fixed z, even on the curve, because it's a derivative. And with very little pain, you conclude that this function h, so defined, is holomorphic. Well, it's holomorphic here, it's holomorphic here, obviously. It, uh, the two definitions agree in the overlap. So what we have here is an entire function. Well, now let's uh, use the Leroux theorem, which was just mentioned about 20 minutes ago. This particular entire function, what happens to it when z goes to infinity? It's, it goes to zero. So this entire function is, is identically zero. OK, so this is identically zero. Uh, pull out, the, now when, when z, see here we have to make no uh, uh, requirement that z should not be on the curve. Well now suppose that z is not on the curve, then you can pull this piece out and you get the form. I think this is absolutely incredible. Because that theorem is 150 years old. And uh, there exists, uh, simply does not exist, it's a really simple proof in the literature. And here it is. Uh, I think, uh, well, I, I tried to look at this and analyze what, uh, what was really new about it. And uh, a couple of things occurred to me. One was that uh, you start, always start out with taking the point Z off the curve. And well, you start out to saying that z lies inside a simple closed curve. Of course, uh, we all know now that simple closed curves are completely, uh, in fact, the curve simple closed is completely irrelevant for integration purposes. But you start out to the point inside, where the index is 1, and then you get the Cauchy formula in the usual way. In the later formulations, you still take the point z off, out, uh, well, not on the curve. If you have a complicated curve that chops the plane up into a lot of regions, you get different problems in each region. Well, here you don't have a different problem, because if you formulate it this way, you can take z on the curve. It makes perfectly good sense. So there's a new bit of uh, a different way of looking at it. Something else that occurred to me that was new or different was that here's a function which is given by uh, different looking expressions in different regions. And I've been trying to think back to a sort of broadly classical function theory. One doesn't often see that. 
that a function is given, an automorphic function is given by different expressions in different regions. Of course, I'm, I'm fully aware of the fact that if you take a power series and look at the analytic continuation, you get a different power series. But apart from that, uh, I know of no significant example where this thing is done. And it occurred to me that, that this sort of thing is done quite often in several complex worlds where you patch things to design theorems, design problems, and so on. So I suspected that Mr. Dixon, who in some cases is a part of the college of Ontario, had perhaps done some work in several complex variables. And I looked through the reviews back for about 15 years, and there were quite a number of papers from John D. Dixon. Every one of them was in finite groups of numbers here. <laughs> <laughs> So much about the uh, <laughs> uh, the next oldest theorem, probably is. Uh, where shall I go? Over here. The next oldest theorem is undoubtedly the Riemann mapping theorem. <coughs> it is also the only one, I believe, uh, which is going to be mentioned in all three of these lectures. It was proved in 1851. Strictly speaking, it wasn't completely proved, but that's not the point. The, uh, the most amazing thing about the theorem is that it was ever conjectured. Uh, and uh, here is where my, uh, if you think this is my contention begin to come in. I claim it was conjectured at about the right time. Uh, I claim that if uh, the Riemann mapping theorem had not been conjectured until, say, about 1920, or maybe even uh, 1900, that uh, people would have jumped on the poor man and said, yeah, this is nonsense, can't be, can't be, uh, can't be true. Uh, Riemann had a notion of a simply connected region bounded by a nice curve. There were physical considerations which led to the idea that the theorem was reasonable. If someone had drawn him a something like this, and it said, well, now let's take a canter set of arcs in here. <laughs> and, here it's like this. and then somebody had come in and gave, shown him Rao's example of a domain whose boundary was also the boundary of three other domains. <laughs> and in the, in the early uh, 20th century, there was all this pathology going on. The people built uh, canals, uh, family <laughs> canals being all over. Now, I don't know what Raymond's psychology was, but I think him, if someone had told him, now look, you can't possibly map this in an angle preserving manner onto a disk. Uh, well, he might have said, well, okay, we'll just have to work harder. <laughs> or he might have said, well, maybe you're right, and we have to put some conditions on the boundary. And uh, his proof, as we all know, did contain a gap. He set it up as a variational problem, and uh, he assumed the existence of the uh, maximum, minimum, I guess it was a maximum problem. No, he minimized the dearest range of And the boss just pointed out that you know, all such problems don't always have solutions and so forth, and he'll straighten it out. And later on, of course, uh, the proof was invented, which uh, we still teach. I think it's the only textbook proof that exists. It's the one that uses normal families, and it's pure black magic. I mean, it doesn't uh, give you any idea what the, where the function comes from, from, from the geometric standpoint. It's, it's it gives you no information whatsoever. It's a beautiful proof. It's perfectly clear, perfectly clean, no doubt about it. But it sort of bypasses the geometric picture completely. And uh, my contention is that if uh, no one had happened to conjecture this theorem until 1920, or someone like Marcin Kiev, which is only nonsense, can't happen. Now, I claim also that no one can prove that I'm wrong on this. <laughs> <laughs> and furthermore, I'm going to give some further evidence. And uh, the evidence concerns another problem, another theorem, which I think was not conjectured at the right time. Which was uh, what I'm talking about is polynomial approximation. The uh, <coughs> let me sketch a. An uh, outline here. In about 1885, Weierstrass proved the theorem everybody knows. If you have a continuous function on the unit interval, 
It can be uniformly approximated by polynomials. So that's the granddaddy of all approximation theorems. Except that it shares the honors with Runge, who wrote his paper in the same year. I still think that Vastras uh, uh, was earlier. Vastras has a, had a reputation of publishing things very late, or well, not publishing them at all. And certainly the Vastras theorem is a, it's a more elementary theorem in some sense or another. But Runge proved the theorem that uh, if you have a region in the plane, a homomorphic function in it, and any compact subset of that plane, except that it call it or uh, that region, we didn't call it compact, it doesn't matter. Then uh, the given holomorphic function can be approximated uniformly on the compact set by rational functions whose poles are outside the region. And he said this is a remarkable paper. It, it reads just like modern mathematics. It's very clear, very clear. Just it gives the construction, and that's it. Well, there are these two things. Here we have polynomials. Let, let's think about the uh, simply connected region now. In that case, the one we to point out, the approximation can be done by polynomials. So there are two uh, different theorems here. One asserts that every continuous function on a compact interval can be approximated. Here, every holomorphic function in a region can be approximated by, by polynomials uniform and compact subset. There are sort of two different types of theorems. <coughs> Nothing happened to this for 40 years. And in 1926, <coughs> Walsh wrote two papers, back to back. This really should have been one paper. It's the same, same idea. <laughs> <laughs> where he uh, does uh, the Weierstrass theorem on Jordan curves in the plane. And here, he, uh, the setup here is this. I let K always be a compact subset in the complex plane now, so that uh, the difference is connected. Every K from now on has these properties. The compact set is just not disconnected. Walsh proved it for k equal to the closure of a Jordan domain. Uh, what, if, let me say expi explicitly what he proved. He proved that if you have a continuous function on the closure, on the closure of such a region, which is homomorphic inside, then you can approximate uniformly on that closure, on k, by polynomial. Now, the difference between Runge and Walsh is this. If you look at your set here, Runge's theorem says that if you have a function which is holomorphic in a slightly larger open set, then you can approximate on the closure here. Walsh says you don't need the uh, holomorphic outside here. You only need continuity up to the boundary. <laughs> and from this theorem here, this one follows quite easily. Now, Walsh uses uh, conform mappings very strongly here. He uh, closed it down on the given Jordan region by a uh, shrinking sequence of uh, simply connected curves. He looks at uh, the disk. He looks at all the mapping functions from this disk to the uh, family of regions. He closes down. He uses uh, hard machinery. He uses Carol-Theodorus theorem that uh, these mapping functions are continuous enclosure. He also uses a theorem of uh, Courant. Uh, which deals, which states that if you have a sequence of regions like that, closing down, and you look at the mapping functions, which take this point to that point and preserve directions, then the sequence of mapping functions will converge uniformly the closed disk. That's a hard theorem. Well, anyway, by 1926, one had gone from just that little bit from. Uh, to closed Jordan, curve, closed Jordan domains to uh, continuous functions from rather than having functions which are whole in slightly larger open set. The next thing here occurred in 1930. It was the Hartog Rosenthal. Hartog Rosenthal.
They look at compact sets K, whose two-dimensional measure is zero, compact sets in plane, and they prove the Kvarshaw theorem. That every continuous function of such a set can be every continuous function, no holomorphy, of course. Every continuous function of K can be uniformly approximated by polynomials. Then over to uh, this side again. There is a theorem by Carroll. I won't write down exactly what the conditions are. It again concerns sets K, which are closures of regions. But the boundary does not necessarily have to be Jordan curve. There are conditions on the boundary, complicated topological conditions. And again, the same conclusion. In uh, 1934, Another thing on the back and forth. Uh, Lagrangius proved the case where the general case where the interior of K is empty. And of course, still, uh, K does not separate the plane. So we have the, uh, note that these two things here, of these two things, neither one contains the other. There are some positive measures. These are, these are, these are different uh, hypotheses here. Uh, this is a uh, definitive theorem, in a sense, because the, if you want to be able to approximate all continuous functions on K by polynomials, where well, K can't have an interior, because functions which are <coughs> Every function which you can approximate uniformly would have to be holomorphic in the interior. So as far as sets without interior are concerned, which of course all of these are, if you regard themselves as a plane, this ends the story. But it's not yet the end of the story anyway. In uh, 1940, uh, Keldish <coughs> proved uh, a theorem somewhat like Farrell's. Here, the, the, again, it concerns the set K, which is the closure of a domain. The topological condition here is simple enough that I'll state it. It is this. Of course, the picture is much too simple to give the flavor of it. The region, uh, say omega, should be di divided by some arc, gamma, into two regions, such that if you look at the boundary of omega intersected with the omega 1, intersected with the boundary of omega 2, you should get just gamma. If, I have no idea how this condition was proved. Uh, I found this statement in the uh, Regalian uh, paper, a uh, statement of Kelly's result. I don't know how one can make use of such a condition. But, uh, okay, that's it. In 1945, Kelly's had a further <coughs> improvement here. And he got a definitive theorem for sets with interior. The theorem was simply that uh, K should be the closure of a region. And uh, of course, still C minus K should be connected. And the theorem was that any function which is continuous on K and holomorphic in the interior of K is a uniform limit of polynomials. <laughs> so here we have a definitive theorem of this type and a definitive theorem of this type. And finally, we get to the real theorem. Which is Magellan's theorem, which tells, uh, I wish my board was bigger, Magellan should straddle down here. Namely, uh, take any compact set which does not disconnect the plane, take any continuous function on it that is holomorphic at interior points of K, if K has an interior, and you can approximate this function uniformly on that set of polynomials. And that contains everything. That's it. 
And let me get back to my opinionated point. I think that nobody conjectured that theorem. Nobody had the guts to conjecture that theorem. Because uh, the proof that Megillian uses uh, uses a little bit from conformal mapping, not very much. Use green theorem, uses ingenuity, which plenty of people had in 1920. <laughs> it does not. Uh, borrow anything from the earlier results. I mean, it, it, it is not a synthesis of uh, these proofs here, or even of these cases. It starts off from scratch and does the approximation. I think in uh, Walsh's proof, for instance, uh, this was the best known theorem, best known earlier theorem. Uh, very useful for the case. I think if one goes back, and Walsh's paper is short, it's a couple of pages, but he uses uh, Curran's uh, theorem on sequence of conformal mass, and he uses the uh, Cartier-Cartier-Dury theorem. I think if one uh, considers the whole background that is needed for Walsh's proof, and the whole background that is needed for this one, I think this one is easy. Uh, again, this proof is very constructive. This is quite in the spirit of uh, the Russian school of uh, approximation theorists. There has been a functional analysis proof since then using ideas of Wormer, Glicksburg, and Harvard, gave the real final version of the book. But still, I mean, uh, these use fancy machinery. They use uh, the usually algebra kind of machinery. But the, this proof here is not very difficult, and it could have been given 50 years ago. Well, polynomial approximation leads to functional analysis. I had to talk about functional analysis because it was announced that I would. <laughs> and uh, I would like to discuss the role that complex variables plays or has played in functional analysis. Functional analysis uh, is uh, Topological vector spaces, if you like. Uh, original because of binary spaces, of course. But uh, even there, the only binary spaces that were considered for a long time were over the real field. If you look at uh, papers in Fundamenta, Studio, look at any uh, binary product, the words function, the words of formal system, and so on, all refer to real valid functions. Uh, the scale is always real. There is one exception. There was a paper by uh, Wiener. Let me see what was the date. Uh, 1923. Wiener pointed out, this was very soon after Barnard's uh, original work was done. Wiener pointed out that uh, one could talk about uh, these non-linear spaces over the complex field, these complex scalars. And Wiener actually talks about introducing the notion of an analytic function. So we have Barnard space x and the region omega in the plane. We can have mappings from omega into x, which are analytic in the sense that they are from shade derivatives of the complex field. And Wiener points out, it doesn't make much fuss over it, and, uh, that uh, a lot of theorems carry over very easily from the scalar value case to the vector value case. He says in essence that any theorem that uses absolute values and nothing else, any proof, you just stick the norms in and you'll get the theorem. Uh, things like the Cauchy, he points out the Cauchy formula, he points out power theory representations, uh, things like that. Incidentally, uh, I think I should take time to uh, lay another, uh, solve another puzzle, not puzzle really. But uh, it's well known that Wienerfeld was very sore about uh, not having been given much credit for uh, inventing the axioms for binary spaces. He did develop axioms almost uh, at about the same time. And in his biography, he says that uh, he uh, didn't pursue that subject because he didn't have a taste for soft analysis. He liked hard analysis. But in this paper here, he has a footnote. And he must have forgotten that footnote in the later years. 
because in the footnote he says, uh, after saying that he has postulated some would like those of Mr. Bonner, he said that the paper is called Note on the Paper of Bonner. He said, however, as my work only dates back to August and September 1920, and Bonner's was already presented for the PhD degree in June, 19, June 1920, he has priority. I have here employed Bonner's postulates rather than my own, because they are in a, in a form more immediately adapted to the treatment of the problem in hand. So, uh, I don't think that being up should have worried too much about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing is, that I want to get at, that from this point on, complex scalars, well, complex scalars were mentioned here, and from this point on, except for <coughs> except for that, complex scalars vanished from functional analysis until about 1938. And in 1938, all of a sudden, all sorts of things happened. <coughs> there was a paper by Dunford in the transactions. It was concerned with uh, this <coughs> preceding this paper here in the same ratio as a long paper by Pegs on vector value integration. There's Dunford's paper on this primarily concerned with uniform boundedness principles. And he has one theorem there, it's a 50-page paper. The last paper, the last term in the paper concerns holomorphic functions, vector value holomorphic functions. And he proves that uh, weakly holomorphic implies strongly holomorphic, which is a non-trivial fact uh, by any standards. Weakly holomorphic means this, we have a mapping F from omega into X. If you uh, look at f of v and hit it with some functional x star of x, this should be homomorphic function of v in the ordinary complex sense. It's only homomorphic means if the shape differential should be okay. It's only homomorphic obviously implies weakly homomorphic, but the converse depends on a lot of functionality. It depends on the uniform boundaries principles, on the uniform theorem, and so on. Incidentally, at the time, I'm going to lift another paper here, the one of us subject paper, which gives a complex version of the Hanbana theorem, which was not known before then. Dunford realizes, naturally, that he needs a Hanbana theorem in the complex case, and he proves it. But he proves it with the own constant, he proves it with the square root 2. That's you, which you get if you take your functional, split it up into three or part of the measure, part and add up in the obvious way. Now, the, uh, the fact that you, have a, that you didn't prove it with square root 1, for this particular purpose it was irrelevant, but this is one of the cases where the best constant is really important. Because the cases of equality, uh, it's very important to study the cases of equality in lots of extremal problems. The cases of, uh, of extremal functions, they give you their interesting functions, they give you a lot of extra information. Well, since I've done for here, let me list one of the subject. We all know how the <coughs> complex proof, how the complex bound of uh, bound of theorem is proved in the real case is by a very simple trick, which takes one line. But to find that trick, apparently, took some time. Incidentally, there was an earlier paper that deals with the complex bound of theorem by Murray, 36, 37. He proved it for LP spaces, complex LP spaces. And again, he splits things into real and imaginary parts, but he takes the functions as such and splits them into the real parts and imaginary parts. And this is something you can't do to a vector in a space. You can't split it into a real part and imaginary parts. You can take the functional and uh, look at it as a real part and imaginary part, but you can't take one vector in a vector and split it into two. So that, that earlier proof was really a special proof. Let's see what else happened in 38. There was a paper by Taylor. Right. This is Taylor, who had written this thesis, uh, oh, about the year before, I guess, 36, where he takes up uh, Wiener's ideas and uh, pushes them further. In particular, he proves Liouville theorem for vector-valued functions. 
also to stand with theorem that we can prove uh, well known for the scalar case, he got for the vector value case. But he got one very remarkable result. He got the result that, uh, what we stated over here. He proved the following. Suppose x is a bound of space complex bound of space, and T is a bounded linear transformation on X. It proves that then the spectrum of T is not empty. And it proved it in the way which uh, proved the theorem and Banach algebra nowadays. We took the resolvent, T minus of lambda I inverse, for lambda in the resolvent set, which is an open set. He had plenty of machinery to prove that this was a holomorphic function. <coughs> if the resolvent set is empty, this is an entire function, whose values, incidentally, are in here now, in this final space of operators. And uh, obvious also that as lambda goes to infinity, the norm of this thing goes to zero. And the vector value version of Liouville's theorem gives you <coughs> the contradiction you need. Well, this is identical to zero, but if it's zero, it can't be inverted. Well, Gelfand wrote his paper, his famous paper on norm rings, which Michael Barr held with, in 1941. And of course, one of the basic theorems in that paper is this theorem here, but not for operators on a Banach space, for a general Banach algebra. This is the basic theorem from which you get that the uh, that every uh, Banach algebra that's a field is one-dimensional. This gives you the the fact that all every maximum idea is a kernel of a complex homomorphism. The, the whole machinery of Banach algebra is based on this. Now the point I want to make, and I've never seen this uh, credited to Taylor anywhere else, or anywhere, somebody else, is this that this special case, then to prove the non-emptiness of the spectrum here for operators on a bound of space is the general case. There's nothing special about it. Because if you take any bound of algebra, each element acts on the algebra as an operator by either right life multiplication, which you already want to have it act. <coughs> and its spectrum in the bound of algebra sense is exactly the same as its spectrum as an operator on the algebra. If you had an, an, uh, an element in the Banach algebra with empty spectrum, the spectrum as an operator, as a left multiplication operator, would be empty, and it can't happen. So, well, I don't know what I'm trying to prove here. Uh, I'm trying to point out that uh, this theorem, this basic theorem in Banach algebra, which I believe was, has always been credited to Galfan. Um, I must confess, I looked through papers, and it, uh, usually there's no, no particular credit given. It's just one of the theorems that we know. Uh, but it was proved by Taylor in this, uh, in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <coughs> let me get back to, uh, the problem of uh, to the psychological problem of finding theorems. There are a lot of cases, of course, where theorems are discovered simultaneously by several people, independently and simultaneously. And uh, sometimes it isn't clear at all where the idea came from, why, it, uh, why people think about a certain theorem at a certain time. Uh, I know one case uh, of this from my own experience. It's the uh, interpolation theorem, which Carlos improved at about the same time. Uh, you take any set here, contact set K of measure zero. You prescribe any continuous function on it, and you can find the continuous function of this, which is a morphic inside, which extends a given one. 
Uh, both of us did this, I believe 1956 was the year. Uh, my proof uh, could have been given by Fatou in his thesis in about 1904. He used no machinery that he didn't have. Carlson used a bit of functional analysis. And uh, since this is sort of an informal talk, I might as well brag a bit and say that I got a result that was a little better than Carlson, than Epsilon, and one doesn't, one doesn't often beat Carlson at anything. So. <laughs> Uh, Carlson proved that uh, if you can get the, you can start a continuous function here, say f is less than 1 on k, and epsilon is anything positive, then you can get an extension with the required properties, which is nowhere bigger than 1 plus epsilon. Well, I got the same result with 0. Which, uh, the Lincoln model to this, that uh, hard analysis may give better results than soft analysis. Yeah, they say call this new functional analysis and something just slipped away. But the point is that uh, I don't remember why I was thought of this problem at that time. Well, I guess I was thinking of uh, interpolation in general, so I was thinking about function algebra, so some such thing. And somehow it must have been in the air, and uh, it occurred to me, well, what about this problem? It was obvious that uh, the measure had to be positive, so the first question is what happened if the measure is zero, and it was. The, uh, the proof I had, uh, I knew at the time perfectly well that there was a very close relation between this interpolation theorem and the FNM Ries theorem, uh, simply because uh, well, the proof started out the same way. Started out the same way as the, the original proof of the FNM Ries theorem, but then it, things went a little differently, and one gave one and one gave the other. But I could not make the connection. I could not have establish any causal relation between the two. And that's what Bishop did uh, a couple of years later. He uh, showed that, uh, without going into details, that any time you have an FNM Ries theorem, you also have an interpolation theorem. In fact, it is a very short peak interpolation. And that has been generalized to all sorts, of, it has been extended to all sorts of situations from there. There's another theorem like this, which uh, came up in a very mysterious fashion. Much more recently, I think it was 1968. Uh, Gleason wrote a paper, and uh, Kahan and Zelasko wrote a paper. Uh, both are very short, both prove the same theorem, both use the same proof. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the theorem. You let A be a one of algebra. And uh, well, we can phrase it either in terms of subspaces or in terms of linear functionals. Let me phrase it in terms of linear functionals. Suppose you have phi, a uh, linear functional, you don't even have to assume that it's continuous, <coughs> and you assume that the null space of phi, well, that you assume that phi of x is different from zero if uh, x inverse exists. In other words, the uh, null space should contain no invertible element. Put the same this way. If it's invertible, then it's not enough. Well, the conclusion of the theorem is that then phi is, is multiplicative. So the phi is a homomorphic. These, these are obviously necessary conditions. Uh, we can also state it in terms of uh, subspaces of four dimension one. You can simply you can say that a closed subspace of four dimension one, which contains no invertible element, is a maximal ideal. It's a characterization of maximal ideals. In fact, that's how I think it's the title of one of these. Uh, both of them use uh, classically complex variables. They use uh, the theorem of Palomar that if you have an entire function of, uh, well, I guess if it's only used for 
order one. Hadamathium I'm referring to is that uh, if you're in a power function of finite order, then it's a canonical product can be the e to polynomial. Or they use the case of order one, in the case, actually the special case for the theorem. So they don't use the full force of Hadamard theorem, but they both quote that theorem. In the, in the proof, we proof go. Now, I know all three of these uh, mathematicians and ask them where they come from. Why do you, why do you think of such a theorem? What is it good for? Nobody told me. Nobody knows. <laughs> that was a nice film. They happened to find it. Well, <clears throat> I think I shouldn't take too much time because there's all this beer waiting to be drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to mention uh, another area in which. Uh, Complex variables has played a great uh, role. That is a, the area of partial differential equations. And here, like in so many other uh, cases where two fields of mathematics impinge on each other, the uh, flow is not one way at all, but it's, uh, it's both ways. In other words, each of the fields uh, is very fruitful for the other. For example, <coughs> the, uh, let's talk about this arrow here, partial differential equations being good for a function theory. This is especially true of functions of several complex variables, of course. The, uh, anyone who's looked at the book of Hermann, though, or knows the work of Andreotti, Korn, I've dropped so many names now, I'm running out of names, my memory is fading. Note that uh, this equation here is the basic equation of the whole theory. And the more you know about solutions of this sort of equation, the more you know about homomorphic functions of several variables. Uh, the question of solidness with certain boundary conditions, with certain growth conditions, uh, with other data, all of these partial differential equations questions have direct bearing on function theory. As an example of the other direction, there is the, uh, the Taylor-Wiener theorem in several variables. I guess it should be called Taylor-Wiener-Schwarz by now. So I'm talking about the distribution version, which is due to Schwarz. Uh, this was of basic importance in establishing the existence of fundamental solutions. This is the work of my John and Aaron Price. Where the, the partial differential equations are given on Euclidean end space. Nothing complex about it, nothing analytic about it. Or in subregions of Euclidean end space. They're linear equations, <coughs> perfectly classical objects. And once you establish the existing fundamental solutions, it turns out that uh, to do this, one has to go, one has to embed the real Euclidean space in the complex space. The Fourier transform gets into the picture, of course. And uh, the paler wiener schwarz theorem, which uh, relates Fourier transforms of objects with compact support to growth conditions of the entire functions that you get as a Fourier transform. And uh, I think I was good by this.